Welcome, everybody. I am Tim Black. I'm the co-director in the Social Justice Institute. And we are thrilled to have James Horman here to kick off our criminal justice series this semester. So we have James Foreman today. Um, Bruce Western will be here next month. Uh, in November, there is a report that's actually hot coming off the press right now, hot off the press right now as we speak on collateral consequences locally uh, that's being put out by the Fund for Economic Future. We're gonna have a panel discussion about that issue uh, in November. Um, and then also right now through Martin Luther King Day, <clears throat> there is a photo exhibit that's moving around the country that's called Prison Nation. Um, and we are going to assemble a panel of uh, formerly incarcerated men and women who will be uh, talking about providing their own sort of personal stories, narratives, and reflections on prison, and, and that will be in December. Um, in just the next couple of weeks, we have several events as well, which I want to make sure that you're aware of. Um, on Tuesday, uh, we are having an event entitled Childhood Trauma at the U.S. Border, which will be a panel discussion. Um, on the week of, next, all next week, uh, at MSAS, we are co-sponsoring an event, which is an art exhibit and live art installation event entitled Clear, or Queer Love Then and Now. Um, on October 3rd, we have an event that we're co-sponsoring with the uh, Master of Public Health program entitled Gun Violence in America. And then on October 4th, um, we have an event entitled, which is a part of the uh, Hispanic Heritage Month, entitled Aftermath, Puerto Rico, Hurricane Maria, and Cleveland Resettlement. Now, if you're wondering why it is I'm talking into three microphones, it's complicated. It's complicated. Um, but just, uh, it, it has to do with taping and, and so forth. So uh, bear with us as uh, we move through this wireless world. Um, so how did this event come about? It all happened with a knock on the door. And it was Arthur Effenchik who knocked on my door last spring, I think it was. And Arthur and I had heard, um, had heard James speak at the City Club. He was here last year at the City Club to talk about his book. And those, for those of you who don't know Arthur, Arthur is, uh, he works as an assistant to the, the Dean in the College of Arts and Sciences. He's very, very committed uh, to the Emerging Scholars Program. You probably often see him in Crawford sitting and working with students uh, in that program. And so Arthur knocks on the door and Arthur says to me, um, Tim, James Foreman is going to be here. He's going to be at Cleveland State. Uh, in, in September. And I think we could get him to come and speak here during the day. And I said, well, that's fantastic, Arthur. I said, what makes you think he would come? And Arthur said, because I would tell him to. <laughs> <laughs> and so to understand that, you have to understand the relationship between Arthur and James. So I'm gonna read just from James's acknowledgments what he has to say about Arthur. It says, Arthur Evanchek read every word of every chapter dozens of times. Arthur's eyes were the first to see a draft and the last to review any changes. In between, we spent hundreds of hours discussing and debating the ideas and arguments that appear in these pages. I am forever in his debt. Arthur Evanchek. <clears throat> So, so those of you who are in the Emerging Scholars Program, you're in good hands. You're in very good hands. Um, okay, so after this event, uh, we will have a book signing. Uh, books are, are in the back, and, uh, and James will be up front to sign the books. Uh, some of you already have the book. I know this because we just finished reading it in my Racial Inequality and Mass Incarceration class, and so those students are here, and they're ready for you, James. They're ready for you. Okay, James Foreman Jr. Let me say a few words about him and I'll turn over the mics. Um, James Foreman Jr. is a professor of law at Yale Law School. He attended public schools in Detroit and New York City before graduating from the Atlantic Public Schools. 
After attending Brown University and Yale Law School, he worked as a law clerk for Judge William Norris in the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals and Justice Sandra Day O'Connor at the U.S. Supreme Court. After clerking, he joined the Public Defender Service in Washington, D.C., where for six years he represented both juveniles and adults charged with crimes. During his time as a public defender, Professor Foreman became frustrated with the lack of education and job training opportunities for his clients. So in 1997, along with David Domenici, D Domenici, he started the Maya Angelou Public Charter School, an alternative school for school dropouts and youth who had previously been arrested. A decade later, in 2007, Maya Angelou School expanded and agreed to run the school inside DC's juvenile prison. That school, which had long been an abysmal failure, has been transformed into the leadership of the Maya Angelou staff. The court monitor overseeing DC's juvenile system called the turnaround extraordinary. Foreman taught at Georgetown Law from 2003 to 2011 when he joined the Yale faculty. At Yale, he teaches constitutional law, a seminar called Race, Class, and Punishment, and a seminar called Inside Out, Issues in Criminal Justice, in which Yale law students study alongside men incarcerated in a Connecticut prison. We also have that program here, by the way. Um, Professor Foreman teaches and writes in the areas of criminal procedure and criminal law policy, constitutional law, juvenile justice, and educational law and policy. His, his particular interests are schools, prisons, and police, and those institutions, race, and class dimensions. Professor Foreman's first book, which is the book that he's talking about today, Locking Up Our Own Crime and Punishment in Black America, has won, was on many top 10 lists, including the New York Times 10 Best Books of 2017, and was awarded the 2018 Pulitzer Prize for general nonfiction. Please welcome James Foreman, Jr. Thank you. So just to further complicate things, I'm not going to use either of the mics. <laughs> I have yet a third mic. Uh, Tim, I really appreciate that, that wonderful introduction. Um, I appreciate uh, the work uh, of, of the Social Justice Center. Um, I, too, want to just say a word about Arthur. You heard about him. And, and every word in those acknowledgments is correct. If anything, it's an understatement um, about Arthur's role in, in the creation of this book. Um, but you heard the Tim say that Arthur told Tim, well, it's going to happen because I'm going to tell James to do it. And you know, Arthur, if y'all know him at all, he's a very quiet, kind of sort of unassuming person. And you could make the mistake of misreading or misunderstanding what that means, but he has an, an insistence and a perseverance that is really quite remarkable. So we would have these long debates, and then we would finally, finally, most of the time he would persuade me to make a particular change, but every once in a while I would hold on to some other position, and I would say, Arthur, we're just going to have to agree to disagree. So then he wouldn't respond. <laughs> And then like two or three weeks later, or a month later, or at the end of another email about a whole nother chapter three months later, it'd be P.S. I know we agreed to disagree, <laughs> but if you will indulge me, I just have one final comment to offer, and I just knew I was done for then. So, so thank you, Arthur. It's really wonderful to see you. Uh, I, uh, Tim mentioned that there are going to be b uh, books for sale. Uh, I want to acknowledge uh, Debbie and, and her team from an amazing bookstore, a cultural exchange uh, on, on Larchmere, is it? Yeah. If you have not been to this bookstore, please go uh, check it out. It is a special place. I've been hearing about it for, for many years uh, from Arthur. And the one thing I do want to say about the books is that so. Some years ago, when I was in college, I was on heavy, heavy financial aid. And financial aid was great. It got me through college. It got me through law school. But one thing about financial aid, at least then, and I think it's still true now, talking, from, talking to a lot of my students, is it, all, it covered the essentials, but it was never any room for anything extra. And I remember going to a book talk uh, when I was in college, and I wanted to get this book. And I just didn't have money to buy a book and have it signed. 
And I didn't know at the time that I was ever going to write a book. But when I did write a book, I remember back to that time. And I determined that whenever I go to universities or libraries, um, one of the things that I want to say to people is, the books are for sale on a pay-what-you-can basis. I don't want to let funds or resources stop anybody from who wants to leave here with a book and with a signed book. Do not let funds or resources stop you. Go to the bookseller. They're aware of the situation. You give them what you can, including a handshake. If a handshake is what you have, I know they'd appreciate a smile. Uh, and then get a book, and the rest will, see, rest will be taken care of and come get it signed. So let me talk about, let me start by talking about my motivation for writing this book in the first place. And one of my motivations had nothing to do with the criminal legal system. And I'm evolving. I, you'll see references in the book to the criminal justice system. And l over the last year, year and a half, I've been giving talks. and. P I had become more aware of the problem of even calling it, uh, using the word justice in the system. So more and more, I call it the criminal legal system, although you will hear me go back and forth between the two, using the two terms. But this one, th this motivation had nothing to do with that system. And it's just the fact, the simple fact that, and I don't know if anybody else is like this, but for me, I'm always frustrated if I go to see a movie or television show, play, and there's no African American representation. You know, uh, black people are just kind of written out of the story. Or really, what is almost more common, and in, in a way just as bad or even worse, is there'll be one character. And the one character is supposed to stand in for the entire African American community. And I knew that when I sat down to write something, I wanted to write something that portrayed the diversity and the complexity and the different perspectives, the arguments that take place so that somebody could see this complex, often in disagreement, multifaceted community on the pages. So I knew that was important. And my second motivation very much grew out of the criminal legal system. There are a lot of stories in this book. It's history and argument, but it's fundamentally wrapped in a set of stories. And one of those stories is of a young man that I represented by the name of Brandon. Brandon was a teenage client of mine, uh, 15 years old, Washington, DC. He had been charged with possession of a gun and a small amount of marijuana, $15, $20 worth. And he had pled guilty. He was facing sentencing. And I was his public defender. And I had taken the job of being a public defender because I viewed it, as I still view it, as the civil rights work of my generation. My parents met in the original civil rights movement. They met in SNCC in the 1960s, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. My dad is African American. My mom is white. They were an interracial couple at a time when those marriages were illegal in many states in this country. And that generation and their effort and their sacrifice and struggle forever changed and transformed this country in ways that we still haven't even yet to fully acknowledge. I mean, theirs was the generation that faced down Bull Connor's dogs, that marched across the Edmund Pettus Bridge, that went to DC 250,000 strong for the March on Washington for jobs and freedom. And yet, right, even with all the changes that their struggle had wrought, changes that made it possible for me to have opportunities that were unheard of for a black man of my father's generation, at the same time, you could still see, I could still see, graduating from law school, that there was unfinished business to the civil rights movement. And the place that I saw it was in our criminal legal system. Now, I'm not saying that's the only place where there's unfinished business, but that's the place where I saw it. Because graduating from law school in the early 1990s, I could see that. We didn't even have the term mass incarceration then. That was a term created in the year 2000. But we already knew and could see the statistics. The sentencing project had already reported that one in three young black men was under criminal justice supervision. That same study, that same study said that at the time black women were the largest single growing subset of the prison system. We already knew that America in the late 1980s had passed Russia and South Africa to earn the dishonor 
of being the world's largest jailer. Right? And I could see some of the, the changes and transformations that had helped to produce that. I, I could see them in my own life growing up. As a child in Atlanta, I grew up in a, mo in a working class, mostly African American, somewhat integrated, mostly black neighborhood. And when I was a kid, there were two huge buildings two blocks from my house. One of them was the Atlanta Federal Penitentiary. And the other was the General Motors plant. That's when I was a kid. Now, fast forward 15 years later, I'm graduating from law school, 1990s. One of those buildings has shut down, padlocks, door shut, job shipped overseas. And another of the building, the other building, had built an addition. And I don't think I need to tell an audience that has the juvenile justice center, the Taj Mahal that I just saw of juvenile justice, this enormous building in a neighborhood that's being deprived of investments otherwise. I don't need to tell people in that city which of those buildings was still standing and which of those buildings had shut down. So that reality and wanting to fight that struggle had brought me to Superior Court, Washington, DC, standing next to Brandon, asking for him to be put on probation. I had a letter from a teacher and a counselor at his school. His mother and grandmother were there in court. They wanted him to come home. The prosecutor in the case was asking him to go to Oak Hill. Now, Oak Hill, you know, like a lot of juvenile facilities in this country, it has a nice name, like an oak tree on a hill. <laughs> you know, combined combine with a terrible, terrible, abusive reality. This is a place of no program. Some stuff on paper city officials would claim they had, but when you went there, it wasn't happening. It was a place where drugs and violence were rampant. It was a place where, as a child, you always left worse than when you entered. The judge had to make the decision in the case, Judge Curtis Walker. And I should say, I changed the names of everybody in the book, all the judges, of course my clients, but also the judges and the lawyers. I changed their names because I wanted to fully and completely protect identity of any of my clients. So he's. This is not his name, but he is a real judge. And he looks out in the courtroom. He's an African-American judge. 40% of the judges in Superior Court in Washington, DC, are African-American at the time, somewhat higher now. He looks out in the courtroom. And what does he see? He sees a young black man facing sentencing, African-American defense lawyer, black prosecutor, not an entirely unusual scene in DC. And he looks at Brandon, and he says, son, here's the, th here's the thing. Mr. Foreman has been telling me that you've had a tough life. You deserve a second chance. Well, let me tell you about tough. Let me tell you about Jim Crow segregation. See, the judge had been a child in those years, so he proceeds to lecture Brandon on what it was like. And he says, see, here's the thing. People fought. People marched. People died for your freedom. Dr. King died for you. And he didn't die for you to be running and gunning and thugging and carrying on and embarrassing your family, embarrassing your community, carrying that gun. So I hope Mr. Foreman is right. I hope you turn it around one day. But today in this courtroom, actions have consequences. And your consequence is Oak Hill. They locked him up. And I was so outraged. I mean, just think about it. The judge had taken the same history that I just told you was my motivation to be a public defender. He invoked the same movement that produced me and brought me to that courtroom in service of locking up my client. As I began to work through my anger, and I, as I think you can see, I'm still, I mean, still in progress on that. <laughs> but as I began to work through it, I began to reflect on the fact that the judge was not alone. 
The city council that passed the gun and the drug laws that Brandon was sentenced under was a majority African American city council. Our police force at the time in D.C. and still today was majority black. The police chief was black. The mayor was black. The chief prosecutor in the city was none other than Eric Holder. And even with all that representation in local government, we were still doing the same thing that the rest of the country was doing. I told you that one in three young black men is under criminal justice supervision nationally. In DC, it was one in two. And so I had to start asking myself the question, how did this come to be? What was happening in this country in the last 50 years that was so powerful, that was so all pervasive, that was so all consuming, that even in this majority black jurisdiction with some semblance of control of local government and of local criminal laws, we were producing the same outcomes. How did that come to be? And that's the question. That's the question of the book. So we could all, we could stop now because there are books for sale. <laughs> and y'all can all get one and read the answer. Um, but since we have like, you know, 35 minutes left, I think I'll give you just the, the synopsis of the argument. So. Oh yeah, you know, I wasn't, gonna, not, I wasn't gonna make them ask questions yet. <laughs> the first thing that we have to grapple with is rising crime and violence and the fear and the anger that it generated in African American communities over the last 50 year period, but especially in two decades, especially in the crack years, late 1980s, early 1990s, and the heroin years in the 1960s. Let me say something about the 1960s because that period is a little less well known than, than the 1980s. The homicide rate in this country doubled in the 1960s. It tripled in DC. It more than doubled in Cleveland. Heroin. Heroin did to black communities in the 1960s what crack would do two decades later. They tested everybody entering the DC jail every year for substances. And in 1963, they found that 4% of the people entering the jail were heroin addicts. By 1969, the 4% had become 45%. That's an epidemic. And it wasn't just the numbers, though. It was also the response that they generated. So to write this book, I looked in archives of local elected officials, mainly, mostly African American. The first city council in Washington, DC, 11 of 13 members are African American. So, and the city, 70% black at the time. So this is basically black elected officials, black citizens writing to their elected officials in the 1970s. And these letters have been captured in the archives of these elected officials who retired and kept the letters that they received from citizens. And what you see is a community that is in pain. You see people writing and saying, I don't understand. We just fought the civil rights movement. And I'm afraid to take my child to school. They're selling drugs on the corner. I don't want them to see that. They're shooting in the park. I can't leave them in the park. I feel like a stranger on my own city streets. I feel like a prisoner in my, own, in my home. And they say over and over again, these letters end with some version of do something. Do something about it. You've got to do something. Now, who's receiving these letters? That's the second major argument in the book. The generation of people that are receiving these letters is the first generation of black elected officials to be elected in any number in this country since Reconstruction. In the 1970s and 1980s, there's an 800% increase in black elected officials nationally. I mean, it's an 800% increase over almost zero, but it's an 800% increase. It's because of the Voting Rights Act of 1965, mainly. This generation of officials, many of them are from the South. Some of them were in the civil rights movement. All of them remember the long history of under-enforcement and under-protection of the law that has marked black history in this country since the beginning. They remember, I mean, my dad used to tell me about this. My dad grew up in Jim Crow, Mississippi, Jim Crow South Side of Chicago, and he used to tell me about the fact that they didn't call the police in their neighborhood when crimes were committed. He said the police weren't gonna come investigate a crime against a black person if they came. The only thing you could be sure of is they would make matters worse. They remember, this generation remembers Southern sheriffs in cahoots with the Klan. And I say Southern sheriffs, but 
There's Southern mentality in lots of parts of this country. Southern sheriff in cahoots with the Klan asked about a homicide in a black neighborhood. They said, that's not a homicide. That's another dead black person. And y'all, they didn't use the words black person. So they are formed and shaped by this history, and now they're in power. They have some amount of control over local government, of police departments especially, and this generation is bound and determined to make the law responsive to those letter writers, those people that are pleading for protection. Those people wouldn't have bothered to write under Jim Crow. They would have known they weren't going to get a response. Now they have black elected officials in government. They believe and demand some kind of response, and some of those officials want to give it. Okay, so crime is rising, violence and addiction, people are scared, and, and some of these officials want to respond and protect. But this then raises the question, why police and why prosecutors and why prisons? Why is that the response that the community got? And here's where, you know, I told you up front that this is a book that's about Fundamentally, it's a book about black people. It's a book about African-American politics and politicians and activists and intellectuals. But any book in this country that is about the African-American community and the choices that black leaders made also always has to be a book about the constraints and the limitations on those folks' ability to choose. So let me talk about so what some of those constraints were. The first constraint is historical. The people that I'm writing about in this book, this generation of officials has been elected to represent communities that because of a history of slavery, which we had in this country for longer than we have not, and we shouldn't forget that, of slavery, of segregation, of Jim Crow, because of a history of wealth discrimination, of redlining, of intentional government actions to, to diminish and to degrade black communities, of choices like where to build the federal highways. I don't know the story right here in Cleveland, but I can tell you who, who's driven through Atlanta or been, okay. If you've driven through Atlanta, you've driven on I-75 or I-85. Atlanta's crazy. Every time I go back, it's more and more lanes. It's like 12 lanes in each direction now. You don't know it, but you are driving through what was called the Black Wall Street, Auburn Avenue. Dr. King was raised there. This thriving black neighborhood was dest destroyed by the decision to put that highway through the middle of it. The highway had to be put somewhere, and when it was put, it was overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly put in the neighborhoods of the people that had the least political clout. So this generation of officials has to protect neighborhoods that because of this history of discrimination are unable to protect themselves. They lack the resources to protect themselves without this over-reliance on police and prosecutors in prisons. And if you Think about it, right? Police and prosecutors are no, they're no neighborhood's first choice about how to create safety. And the reason why you know this is if I ask you right now to close your eyes and imagine a safe neighborhood, when you open your eyes, I can guarantee you the one thing that you will not have thought of in that neighborhood is a police car. But lacking those other resources they were over-reliant on the state, on police and prosecutors because of that historical discrimination. Now, the second constraint is political. The people that I'm talking about, the neighborhoods that I'm talking about, and the officials that I'm talking about are local officials. Black political power has always been most concentrated locally. City council, city hall, county council, local offices, school board. And local politics matters for how we got mass incarceration and how we're going to have to respond to it. That's one of the arguments of the book. But there are limitations to local power, and you see those in the book. For the last 50 years, black elected officials have had what I call an all of the above strategy to fighting crime and violence. They wanted police and prosecutors, and sometimes, unfortunately, even prisons. But they also wanted money for drug treatment and job training and healthcare, and education, 
and after school programs and mental health treatment. They wanted national gun control to go along with the local gun control they were passing in cities whenever they could. They wanted a Marshall Plan for urban America. They wanted the United States government to do for black communities what it did for Europe after World War II, to rebuild, to reinvest, to revitalize. And for 50 years, they went to Congress asking for money for all of the above. And for 50 years, they came back with money for one of the above, law enforcement, police, and prosecutors. The last constraint that I want to mention, and I this is the last constraint that I mentioned in part because it's a constraint that we still suffer from to, to this day. But this was a generation that was constrained by their imaginations. There are a lot of examples of this, but let me give you one. One of the people that I write about is a guy named David Clark. Now, I told you that 11 out of 13 of that first city council in DC, 1975, are African American. David Clark is one of the two white members. He has an unusual biography. He went to Howard Law School in the 1960s. He graduates and works for Martin Luther King, becomes a lawyer for poor people, and gets elected with a grassroots kind of army of volunteers to this first city council. And the thing you need to know for today's purposes is that David Clark was not a drug warrior. In fact, the first thing he does, the first piece of legislation that he proposes in 1975, when he gets into the city council, is marijuana decriminalization. And the story of the attempt to decriminalize marijuana, that's the story of chapter one of the book. So, but just know this, he's not a drug warrior. Now, it's the early 1980s, he's the chair of the city council. And remember those letters I told you that were coming from citizens? They're now increasing in the 1980s. There's an increasing number and ferocity of these letters. And they're focused on heroin addicts. Heroin, which had kind of taken a step back in the 1970s, is now sort of back in force in the early 80s. And you see people writing, and I don't endorse the language of these letters, but they say things like, you know, there's junkies and there's addicts, and they're congregating on our stoops, they're gathering on the corners, they're in the alley leaving dirty syringes in the alleys behind our house and our places of business. And again, they end with some form of do something. You've got to do something about it. Okay, David Clark takes these letters. He forwards them to the head of the relevant government agency. He gets a letter back saying, Council Member Clark, I received your citizen complaint about the heroin addicts were on the case. It's good that he took action. But think about the agency that he forwarded these letters to. Remember, the problem is heroin addicts. That's the problem that has been identified in these letters in public space. Does David Clark, who is not a drug warrior, send them to the Department of Mental Health, Addiction Services, Treatment Counseling, Public Health? No. Who does he send them to? What agency? Yeah, he sends them to the police chief. Because even though he's not a drug warrior, he's an American. And like so many of us, he has come in his core to believe that the problem of an addict in public space is a criminal problem, not a public health problem. It's a problem to which you respond with somebody who has handcuffs and a gun and whose only place that they can take the person is the jail, not a treatment center. And one of the main arguments in my book is that when we're trying to understand how we got to mass incarceration, that it is tempting to look at speeches from presidents or national legislation, and that's important. But it's also essential that we look at small, tiny decisions that were made over 50 50 years and 50 states and 3,000 counties. Some of them were made by people with good intentions, not all, but some. These small, tiny decisions, like the decision of which government agency to forward the letter to when you get a citizen complaint, that those tiny decisions are the individual bricks that collectively have built the prison nation that the United States has become. Now, when I was in school, and I would come and I would, you know, social justice oriented students, like I know a lot of people in this room are, and I would come and I would listen to people give talks about their area of passion. 
and they would come and they would talk and they would in, they would impress upon us the, the urgency and the gravity and the awfulness of the thing that they were working on. And then, at just when they would finish, they would say, okay, thank you, goodbye. And they would leave the room. And it was really demoralizing. And the one thing that I always told myself, along with help people get books, is I wasn't going to do that. So let me spend a couple minutes, and hopefully we'll have more time to get into this in the conversation as well, but let me spend a couple minutes just talking about some things that we can do in response to this problem that I've just described. And I know there's a lot of people in the room that are working on things, and I know that there's ideas in the room that are better than the ideas that I'm even going even to talk about. And there's a lot of collective power in this room. So I'm not saying that what I'm going to talk about are the most important things that we could possibly do. I'm just telling you that they're the things that I'm thinking about right at this moment. And one thing that I want to start with is that we have to have a recognition that as terrible as this situation is, because of the work, including the work of some of the people in this room, there has been serious progress mitigating some of the harms that I've just talked about. Juvenile incarceration rate in this country is half of what it was 20 years ago. That only, be, only happened because of activists and activism and advocates. The death penalty. Last year, there were one-tenth the number of death sentences hand down, handed down as was true at the height in the, early 1980, in the late 80s, early 90s. That's that's a phenomenal, it's one-tenth, it was about 400, it was about 40. 40 is too many. But that is a huge, huge amount of progress that was, again, made because of activists and because of advocates and because of lawyers and because of legislators and because of regular citizens. So as we think about kind of what can we do now, as a law professor, let me at least start with, I feel like I have to start, with a couple things from the, from the Constitution. And this one that I'm going to give you right now is small and it's simple and it's powerful. But small and simple, but it is powerful. Serve on a jury. People get these notices. A lot of us get these notices. You get the jury notice. The first thing you want to do is put it away, move on. Oh, I don't want to do that. I saw this when I was defending cases. We would go for jury selection. And all of the people that came to lectures like this one, all of the people that were upset about the state of our criminal justice system, mass incarceration, didn't even want to call it a criminal justice system, they all took themselves off the jury. They all said, oh, I can't be fair because I think that our system is corrupt. And what I'm telling you is we need your voices. We need your voices in the grand jury when you get called. We need your voices in the pettit juries, the juries that hear these cases. If you don't come and you don't sit and you're not sworn and you don't bring your critical perspective to the facts and the issues at hand, the testimony of the police officer, which somebody might be willing to accept without any question, but you want to say, wait a minute, wait a minute. I know they're not always telling the truth. If you don't come with your voice, then the jury is going to be left with people who don't care. People who don't, all the people that saw this flyer and didn't come. <laughs> and we don't want a just, we don't want a legal system that's where they're the entire decision makers. So juries. Okay, let's not just talk about juries, though. Let's talk about other aspects of politics. State legislation. Voting in, y'all have a major referendum on the ballot in November, and or you could start voting early in, I think it's October 10th. State ballot issue, issue number, one. number one. Number one, to challenge the war on drugs, to argue that money should go, that more pe fewer people should go to prison and push more people into treatment programs, to redirect funds and resources for, from the prison system to the treatment system. This has been, we now have research, I have, a, I have a pile of studies in my office to show 
that this approach that this ballot initiative is proposing is more effective treatment rather than incarceration. But you don't even need a pile of studies because you can just look at what do people who have money do when somebody in their family is suffering from addiction. Because the one thing I can tell you, people will call every number in the book, they will pay whatever sum, they will draw down their bank accounts, they will do anything they can for themselves or for their loved ones before they will say, oh, I think prison is a good place for them. <laughs> So you don't need my studies, you just need your common sense. And I just read, I was reading about this, this, this referendum before I came out here, and I read one of the opponents, who's a judge, I couldn't believe this, one of the opponents says, well, this will, this will take a tool away from prosecutors that currently allows them to put people in prison. And I thought, wait, is that a critique? I was like, yes, that's exactly what it will do. And that's what we need. We know this. Don't let the politics of fear on this fool. We have five states in this country over the last decade have reduced their prison populations by over 20%. And not just blue states, Texas, uh, New York, California. Five states have done it, and all of them, all five, have seen during that same decade crime reduction of over 20%. So don't let them tell you that if you do this, that if you redirect these resources, that crime will go up, because we now have proof that that's not true. OK, so let me just mention a couple of other things beyond, uh, beyond jury service and beyond voting, um, because one of the things that we have to do is not just vote, but then we have to hold people, we have to both pressure people when they're running for office and we have to hold them accountable once they come into office. You know, there's, y'all have done an amazing thing in, in, this, in this community, which is you got together and you organized and you made sure that the prosecutor, you're part of, in a sense, a national movement of people that were challenging prosecutors that uh, were, you know, law and order prosecutors, except when it came time to have law and order for the people that carry badges and carry guns, and y'all effectively got, is it, was his name McGinty? Yeah. To, out of office, okay? But now it's not just getting him out of, out of office. I was, I was rewarded to see, and I want to encourage people to do even more of this, I was rewarded to see that the, the Greater Cleveland congregations had a, had a symposium recently where you all had the new person who came in and we, as well as I think it was a, state, a, a judge, mm -hmm. and it's about holding people accountable, right? It's about going to those forums and saying, okay, either you're running for office and I have these questions for you. Because remember, for the last 50 years, I, Eric Holder s said this 20 years ago, and I, and, and I believe him. He said, when I went to community meetings when I was a prosecutor in D.C., the people that I saw were people that were saying, get those drug dealers off the corner. I take him at, I take him at his word on that. I, I do. I do. So what I want to say is we have to be the people at the candidate forums. We have to be saying, OK, what are you going to do to hold police accountable? What are you going to do, or what have you done, if, you, if you're in office, right, to bring restorative justice programs into our court system, into our schools? What are you going to do to reduce suspensions and expulsions of kids in our schools? I saw that there was legislation passed that reduced the power to sus suspend and expel for children kindergarten through third grade, signed by the governor. Now, that's good news. But it also raises a profound question, which is how are we even suspending or expelling anybody in kindergarten through third grade that we would need legislation to counteract that? So we have to go and we have to ask these questions and make sure that they hear our voices. I'm going to mention one other area, which is my, uh, just a personal kind of passion of mine, which is education. You heard the discussion of the Maya Angelou School working with kids from the juvenile justice system and helping to divert kids from even being in that system to begin with. And I also want to talk a little bit about this inside out and working, getting into prisons, getting into our juvenile justice facilities, and working with people directly. So I teach a class called Race, Crime, and Punishment. 
And a few years ago, I started asking myself this question that I'm pushing you all on, which is what can we do in response? And I thought, well, I'm a professor. Well, I teach classes. Like, that's what the core part of my job. And why don't I try to go into prisons and teach these classes? And I got trained by a program called Inside Out, which I know you have here. And if you're students, I would press your professors, if they're not teaching Inside Out, ask them to go get trained. Any professor can get trained to teach Inside Out in any discipline. It doesn't, you don't have to teach about the legal system. There's Inside Out classes in math, in English, in philosophy, in sociology, you name it. What Inside Out does is it trains professors in how to teach a class where the composition of the class would be half students from the home university and half students from the prison. And you meet every week in the prison or twice a week in some classes in a seminar setting and you study the material. The same material that we would be studying at Yale, we're studying inside the prison. The difference is just who's in the class. And it is powerful. It's transformed. I always tell my colleagues, don't teach these classes for self-interested reasons. But I will tell you that the best teaching evaluations I get in any of my classes <laughs> are in my inside out classes. So if anybody needs to bump up on your teaching evaluations, <laughs> The most powerful evaluations that I get are from the incarcerated students. I teach in a men's prison in the fall semester and in a women's prison in the spring. And this one, at the end of the fall semester, was a men's prison. And a young man wrote me, uh, and he said, I really liked the law that we studied. I liked the rules that we learned. But really what I liked most about this class was I liked that when I entered the classroom, which was in the library. He said, when I entered that classroom and I got ready to enter the seminar circle, I knew that I was entering a place where I was going to be treated like I had something to say, where I was going to be treated like I was smart, where I was going to be treated like, and on some days I would even feel like an intellectual. And I had never had that experience in school before. Now, it's a tragedy right, that he'd never had that experience in school before. Is one of the re that's one of the reasons, undoubtedly, why he was where he was, because of how he was treated by the education system. But now he was in a moment. And I can't tell you, you know, I can't tell you for my particular classes what impact this experience will have, either for the students who are incarcerated or for the students from Yale. But I can tell you that the RAND Corporation has studied this, and they have found that for every dollar we invest in education for people who are incarcerated, Hear this, for every dollar, we as a society get $5 in return. And we get that in return because recidivism goes down and employment goes up when people have the opportunity to get an education. So whether it's an inside out program, or whether it's a tutoring program, or whether it's an art program, I learned about a program called Art Forward. Does anybody know about this program? OK, there's a program call, called Art Forward. Arthur, is it on this campus? On this campus, check it out. It's called Art Forward. It's started by a student here named Jasmine Lee. And students from CASE go to the local juvenile justice center, and they work with the uh, young men and women there on art. So. It, it's almost, our, this system that we've created is so everywhere, it's so all-encompassing, all it touches every part of society, so much so that whatever you're passionate about, whatever you do, whether it's education, whether it's employment, whether it's art, whether it's cooking, whether it's drama, whether it's engineering, whatever it is, there is a way and a place for you to get directly involved in education. This is the last thing I'm going to say before we have conversation. And this isn't a, this one I'm giving you now isn't a particular thing to do. It's just more a way of thinking about social change and social justice and the problem that we're facing and how we're going to respond to it. And it comes from a conversation that I had with my father. It was before he passed, we were watched a movie about the civil rights movement. And when the movie was over, I asked him, what do you think of the film? You were there. And he said, I liked it. He said, I liked that they showed this history in film. 
because more people watch movies than read books, which is something that I might have thought about sooner before writing a book. But <laughs> he said, what I didn't like is that I didn't like that they made it seem like everybody was in the movement. He said, it wasn't like that. Said, right, you know. He said, we were, we were lonely. We were unpopular. They used to run us off of college campuses when we would go try to recruit. The March on Washington had one third approval. Two months before the wash on, March on Washington, when they asked people, do you think that this march is going to be effective or ineffective? Only one third of people said they thought it was going to be effective. 250,000 people went. Then a decade later, 10 million people would say they were there. <laughs> right? So this is the thing that my dad was saying. He was saying when you face an injustice that seems so profound and so insurmountable like slavery or like Jim Crow, and I would add in this moment, mass incarceration, when you face something like that, you can it can feel like you can't change it. And people will tell you that you can't change it. People will tell you to go work on something else. And he said then, though, if you ignore them, right, and if you fight and resist, you will overcome it. And then those same people that told you that it was insurmountable will turn around and say, oh, that was inevitable. <laughs> and they'll make a movie about it. <laughs> so I don't know. Here's the thing. I don't know what idea is in this room, but I know it's here. And I don't know what person or group of people that is in this room, but I know y'all are here. SNCC was started on a college campus. Remember that. I don't know who or what it is, but I know it's in the room that there's an idea and a group of people that has something that is more powerful, or more profound than anything that I have said or anything that you have studied in your classes, as wonderful as they are. You have an idea that is going to help us dismantle mass incarceration and build a system that actually deserves the name justice in it. Right, that protects communities without destroying people's lives in this way. And if you ignore the doubters and the naysayers, you will bring down mass incarceration. And they're going to make a movie about your work. And when they do, Tim Black, Arthur Ebenchek, I we will be there in the front row with popcorn in hand applauding. Thank you. Thank you, James. So, uh, unlike James, when if you we have some time for time for some questions, but you do have to speak into the twin towers here. Um, one to hear you, and then also to get your question recorded on uh, Media Vision. Hi, thank you for being here. My name is Kenise Gray. I'm a recent case graduate, class of 2017. I would like to speak about getting selected to be on the jury or how that can happen. So when I was in high school, I probably was 13 or 14 years old. I live in Slavic Village, the south side of Cleveland, which is a very impoverished environment, but I went to Hawkins School. And one day, um, we had been outside on our porch beyond the time curfew was over. It was 1030. So the police came by. I was on my own porch. The police came into the driveway, um, basically, you know, started to argue with us. We're kids at this point. So I was, you know, arguing back. Um, but one thing the officer told me, you know, he's saying, you're about to get arrested. You need to go into the house. Don't be on your porch, whatever. So I turn around while he's saying this, and he sees my Hawking hoodie. And he goes, are you lost? And I say, no, this is my house. And he goes, but you go to Hawkins. So this is an officer saying something to me. This is my first run in with the police ever. And he goes, thank, thank you, thankful enough you have on that hoodie, so I'm not going to arrest you today. Right? But my neighbors were around. They heard this. They saw this. And so for a moment, 
I was grateful that I had on that hoodie because I felt like it did stop us from going to to jail or wherever we would have went that night. Um, so that was that for me was like my first maybe this is my calling to go to law and all of that. So fast forward to my first internship as a freshman here at Case. I was at Deloitte downtown. Um, I was at work listening to the Trayvon Martin case while I was doing taxes. And when they gave the verdict, I immediately started crying. I'm doing someone's taxes in a cubicle and I'm just breaking down, right? So that was my second time I was just like, you know, I don't, I don't belong here. I got my Master of Accountancy, but I said, this is not where I belong. I belong on a jury. I belong on a bench because I just feel like I can help in this way. But I never get selected for jury duty, ever. All my friends get selected. They don't want to go. I'm always trying to figure out how can I get on jury duty, and it just never works. So do you have any suggestions as to how <laughs> I can help that process and just get that experience because I really want to get that exposure? That's my question. All right. <laughs> so uh, you know, there's a lot, there's a lot there. First of all, you know, thank you for, for, want, for wanting to do it in the way that you do. Um, and I hope that you get on the bench one day so that you can even make sure that the juries that are selected in your courtroom as a judge are a fair and representative uh, cross-section of the population. The first thing I would say is, I don't know if you bring any reading material with you, but like, don't bring, don't bring the new Jim Crow. <laughs> don't, don't bring Brian Stevenson. Don't bring Tom Nahasi Coates. Don't bring books that are critical. Don't bring my book. Don't bring books that are criminal, critical of the system that we have. Um, and beyond that, I mean, obviously there is, of course, I mean, one of the huge problems that we have in the whole jury selection process is there's racial discrimination in the way people are struck from juries, right? We have these things, these peremptory strikes, which both sides are allowed to use. And there's a historical tradition of people, of prosecutors using them to strike African, -American from, the, African Americans from the jury. So you may be being subjected to that. Um, I don't know if the friends that you described that are getting selected, are they white or African American or another race? Uh, both. OK. Right, right. So I don't know if you seem too eager. <laughs> I, say, I think my posts and my thoughts that I share publicly, they're very pro-justice. So I don't know. Maybe, I don't know. Yeah. I'm not sure. To be honest, I'm not really sure. I get struck uh, regularly as well. But I go, I go eagerly. I'm ready to serve. Uh, maybe. I don't know. Maybe you and maybe we should show be late the next time. Like I bet you're on time. Maybe you know. Maybe we seem too eager. I'm. I'm really. I'm not sure. Of, but all I can say is, you know, keep going and keep trying to serve and keep impressing upon your friends who are critical of the system, who might not want to go because they are. You know, that to me is a big thing. Is the people that don't show up because they're upset about the system, um, and so try to convince some of them and maybe together there'll be enough of you that a couple of y'all will be selected for one of these juries. Um, hello, so my name is Viral. I'm a senior here at Case. Uh, and I read your book over the summer and I, I thought it was fantastic. Um, and there was a section in it that really spoke to me because of an incident that happened on campus during the spring. Um, so one of the Cleveland City Council members who is an African-American who represents this area, was stopped by a Case Western police officer. Um, and I remember, I hadn't read your book at this time, so I didn't really know how to respond when I was told this, but a student leader on campus told me that it wasn't racially profiling, it wasn't racial profiling because the officer in question was black. And I, that just didn't sit well with me, but I just didn't know how to respond to that in the moment. So I was wondering if you could like, like how, what, what do you say to someone when they say something like that? Because I know that it's much deeper than that. Absolutely. I'm glad you asked that question. I think it's such an important question. And you know, for those that haven't seen the book, chapter three of the book is basically tells the story of how we went in this country from having no black police officers uh, to having substantial black representation, typically a minority, but, but good numbers, 15, 20, 25 percent in many of our big cities, and in some cities like Atlanta, like 
DC, like Detroit, getting to the point where the forces are even were majority African American, and how the original hope of some of the activists around what they were going to get out, out of black officers on the force, right, was at least for some of them. Part of the story is that kind of different people had different hopes, but at least some people had the hope that this was going to change police behavior in such a way that police were going to be less likely to do exactly what you just described, or less likely uh, to be brutal. And I think that the, the lesson of the last really 100 years is that having black police officers is, in my opinion, it is still very much a worthy goal. But I believe that it's a worthy goal because I believe that because I believe that police jobs are good jobs with good benefits and African Americans deserve their fair share, our fair share of those jobs. But I don't believe in black police officers as a mechanism to change how it is that police function. I don't believe that and I don't think that the history supports believing that. Um, because I think that what we've learned is that the structure and the incentives and the ideology and the training and the resources, everything about policing pushes in the direction of the style of policing that you witnessed, this style of racial profiling, this style of um, quick use, you know, be, being too quick to use excessive force, the style of imagining, your, imagining yourself not as a caretaker of a community, not as in conversation, but as in command, as in charge. And all of those things about how we train and about how we supervise and about how we incentivize and who we decide to hire as officers, right? Do we advertise this job as a job of somebody who has a social work mentality, right? Or do we advertise it as you are military, you like being in the military, come do that, right? No, that's right? This is how this is how these jobs are advertised, straight up. And as long as that's all true, it doesn't matter the color of the officer. And so what I say to people, that's what I say to people like that, is I say that um, I do want there to be African American officers, but the presence of African American officers, and DC is a prime example of this, does not mean that you're not going to have racial profiling. What matters in that instance is the race of the person, right? Because what I can tell you is black officer or white officer, if that city council member weren't African American, they would not have been stopped. And I see, I mean, I see this, I, I, I learned this lesson as a child. It was my, all, my friend group as a kid, my friend group in high school was basically entirely African American. And there was a radical, my complexion gave me a different kind of treatment in my own mostly black but not exclusively black neighborhood, my own neighborhood. I was treated differently when I was alone versus when I was with my friends. Because when I was with my friends, the presence of the group had them read the group as black. But when I was alone, they either didn't know what I was or they thought I was white, they thought I was lost. They didn't, they, 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 like, yeah, I don't know. So uh, that's, that's, that's the reality, and so that's what we have to teach people about. So give them chapter three. Thank you. Um, your description of, of the history of things makes me think of, um, as a society, we are addressing the symptoms of something that's running underneath, and that is institutional racism that has huge historical roots. And so how do we educate the police, whether black or white, the um, policy makers to see that perspective, not see just short sightedness. We need to stop crime as opposed to uh, w with the police, as opposed to doing it with a better educational system, with a more compassionate uh, approach to mental health and so forth. And how much is money? 
uh, pushing us away from that, like, you know, there's profit to be made by incarcerating people and so forth. So uh, I'm hoping for a hopeful response to this. So no, well, the the money question is 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 a huge is a hugely important one, right? And part my argument, my book is is a lot fundamentally about kind of how this system was created, and which is a somewhat different question from how does the system sustain itself? Because you can have incent, you can have motiv motivations and structures that may not have been necessarily driving forces in the creation, but are driving forces of the maintenance. And so once you have, right, this is the issue. And you see this, I mean, everywhere I go, everywhere I talk, people, in, including in black communities, but everywhere, people talk about how this system now needs resources and revenue to sustain itself. And the prisons is, an easy example, but it's not just the prisons. I mean, look at all of these jurisdictions that have all of these fines and fees for everything, and people get multiple fines and multiple fees, and then they can't keep up with their pay payment plans. And you talk to people, I mean, this got a huge amount of attention in Ferguson. Right? And in the Ferguson report, because people learned what a lot of people had known then, and I have to tell you, I hadn't even known the full extent of it, is how much the court system existed in that town exclusively on the backs of poor black people who were funding it. And so people were getting tickets for nothing just to get them trapped in it, just so that the fees would accumulate. And then I started talking to people in neighboring towns, again, connected to some of the themes in my book, and in some, even some of the majority black jurisdictions that are neighboring Ferguson had a similar set of problems. And you talked, to, not to the same extent that Ferguson did, but, and you talked to some people there, and there's people that quietly will just tell you, I'm not proud of this, but these jobs that we now, these jobs that exist, these municipal jobs, these are good jobs, what I was saying about police department, and, if, and I don't want to lose them. And so I think that it does, it calls upon us that are now part of this movement to push to have a broad, to, to really kind of broaden our imagination beyond just taking down the system that we have and but rebuilding an alternative system. So what I want to talk to people about is I want to talk to people about how you can have a job but have it be a new and a better and a different and a more restorative job. So we saw this, you see this in juvenile corrections. We saw this when we entered the juvenile prison in DC. We had all these officers that basically had been trained up to imagine themselves in this command and control model. And they weren't invested in the education of kids. They didn't think that was their job. And they would sit in the hallway, basically, outside of these classrooms. The teachers weren't teaching anything. And then if the kids would get bored, many of them had mental health challenges, get in a fight, the officers come in and basically beat up the kids and take them down and put them in lockdown. And that would just cycle, would just go on day after day after day. And we went to these officers and we said, you could have, we're not taking your job, but we want to give you a new and different and better job. What if you imagine yourself not as an officer, but as a youth advocate? And what if instead of sitting in the hallway, just waiting for a fight and then beating kids up, what if you sat in the classroom inside and you actually sat next to a kid that was struggling with his reading and you're still there, you're still a corrections officer. If something breaks off, you're gonna deal with it, but you're helping him with his reading and his math. And of course, at first they were like, oh, what? This goes back to the training and recruitment. That's not what I signed up for. That's not what I do. That's not who I am. I'm not a social worker. I'm not a teacher. Yeah. You have to find the one ally, the two allies, the three allies. You convince one or two people that they're willing to take a chance on it, which we did. And then guess what? It's a way better job. Like, think about it. Right. How much better is it to sit next to a young person and help them learn to read than to beat them up every third day, 
Now, I, you're not going to convince everybody because there's some people that are going to be recalcitrant and intransigent and you have to work to push the systems to get rid of them. <laughs> but so I guess what I'm saying is that point, if you broaden it up and you broaden it out, what I want to try to do is I want to get people that are in this bloated system and I want to push them to, from the outside to imagine alternatives to what they're doing now. Because I think if we don't do that, we are going to have this incredible resistance of this workforce that is going to might say, listen, I'm philosophically agree with you, but I'm just not prepared to sacrifice my paycheck. Hi, my name is Ashley Sowers. I want to thank you for coming to speak here. This has been amazing, and I'm very excited to read your book. Um, I'm a double alum of Case and currently working in healthcare. Thank you. Go double oh, alum. Sorry, um, I'm a double alum at Case and currently working in healthcare. So I wonder if you have any thoughts about the current response to the opioid crisis, which is actually being considered an epidemic compared to the responses in the 60s and the 80s to the epidemic amongst the black community. Absolutely. And I will answer that question. I'm just noticing the time. I think it was probably maybe the last question. But I'm going to be here. I'm not going anywhere. So I'm going to be sitting right here, up here. So if you have more questions uh, that you want to talk about with or without a book, come see me. I'll be there. Um, so that question that you're asking is, is such an important question because it highlights what we know, but it's a really sort of potent and living example of it, which is the way in which race and our racial perceptions of individuals affects our response and the level and the depth and the kind of empathy and compassion that we either have or we do not have. So in the 1980s, crack cocaine, mostly uh, you know, perceived to be a drug that uh, was used exclusively by African Americans, although statistically that turns out not to have been true. But that's the media perception. And we get this incredible, violent sort of crackdown, national guards coming into cities. We get mandatory minimums, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. Um, and now today, we have a new drug, we have a new face of that drug, and there's a much more talk of compassion and of understanding, and that is the racial dimension. It's also true, and I think we have to really be clear about this, that our rhetoric around compassion and understanding and treatment for people that are suffering from uh, opioid addiction massively outweighs. There's a rhetoric. But if you look at the actual reality of what's going on on the ground with funding and with programs, we're doing a terrible job. We are disserving. So you don't have the mass incarceration rhetoric. You don't have the send the National Guard, lock everybody up rhetoric. You have the treatment rhetoric. But what's the reality? The first thing, after talking about treatment, 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 the first thing that the Republican Congress and President Trump does when they go is they try to defund and dismantle Obamacare, which is providing 80 to 90 percent of the dollars to go to the compassionate treatment that they're saying they support, they're going to eliminate it. So it's rhetorically different. But the actual kind of on the ground, and why is that? Why is that? Why are they doing that? It's because we have, because part of the story is race. And part of the story always is class. The people that are dependent on these programs that are being cut are poor. Whatever race they are, they are disproportionately poor. Even if they didn't start poor, many of them have now been made poor by the toll that the addiction has taken on them and their families. And so again, meanwhile, in my own state of Connecticut, there's treatment programs where there's golf courses and putting greens, putting greens in the basement for the executives that live in New York City who get addicted. Three blocks from my house, there's a beautiful home, this old historic home, and it got like bought, and we're trying to figure out what was going on with it, and there's like young kids standing out in the back, and they're like vaping, and, and I was like, 
Then I went online to try to figure out what was going on. That home, they've got SUVs, Escalades. That home is a treatment center for wealthy kids in Connecticut who were in prep schools, who are addicted, who have money, who now are getting a fairly high level of treatment. So what is true and what remains true is that poor people continue to get the least. So I want us to really try, when we think about this reaction to the opioid epidemic versus crack, to try to keep both of these ideas in our head at the same time. One, which is that the racial dimension has meant that we don't see some of the brutality that we saw in the crack years. And alongside that, the class dimension means that we are lying to people because we say that we're being compassionate, but the dollars and the programs actually are not funding treatment and are not funding compassion. Thank you all. I'll be around. <laughs>